This is just a market on a normal day in Paris. This is the temple closed market in the north of Paris. So calm and subtle on a December morning. You might never know the other side of it some few hundred years back. In this market once stood a big prison built by the Knight Templar and housed many nobles during the French Revolution. One important person among them was Louis the 16th and his family. From this market Louis the 16th took his the last journey of his life towards Place de Concorde on 21 January 1793. Probably this is the first time he ever rode on this path. In his entire lifetime before the revolution he has come out of Chateau de Versailles only once to the northern beaches to see the preparation for the battle against the British. He was humiliated by his own people, forced to wear the revolutionary cap and at the end forced to relieve himself from the demigod status. The huge fall down of Louis XVI from a king to a traitor is followed closely by the French Revolution. The revolution was a self-engulfing fire which burned most of the people who started it like the infamous Robespierre, Tantan, etc. The region of terror resulted in many considered as anti-revolutionaries ending the life in Dilton. What we are going to see in this episode is a journey of Louis XVI towards his deathbed and the rise of the French Revolution together. Chateau de Versailles was built by Louis XIV as a spectacular place to replace Louvre. Before the palace came to extinctions, this place was a swamp and damp area. Louis wanted to take a break from Paris life and to build a huge place for him in his favorite hunting ground. Little did he know that it will be the final resting place for his great grandson. Louis XVI extended the place to a larger extent and had an entire governess happening from Versailles. The nobility class were the eyes and ears of the king. French society during this time was split into three classes. Nobility, people of royal birth, clergy, the people from the church and the common people. They were referred as the three states of French society. The seven year war, continuous famine and the ironic support of French monarchy for the civil war in USA costed French monarchy a lot. This led to more taxation of peasants. The nobility and the clergy were exempted from tax paying. So ultimately the rich paid no tax and the poor paid more tax. So the deficiency in the budget reflected as more tax for the common people. Louis XVI, understanding the gravity of this situation, appointed a Swiss accountant, Necker, to take care of messy financial situation. Necker, being a very good confidant of Louis and advised him on various issues, he put forth an amendment for taxing the nobles, which was not much welcomed by the nobility. Louis had a very little control on the state affair and was too much afraid to check the patience of the nobility class, so he immediately fired Necker. News of Necker being fired from his job was not very really welcomed by the common people. Louis got another finance minister who proposed to spend more and to get more into more debt in order to show off the economy is going on and in turn to get more investments. Unfortunately, it didn't work very well. The Necker was called back again to set the sales right. Just a typical tourist photo. So this is Louvre, which is the one of the biggest museum in the world. This was the palace for the Louis before Versailles came into existence. So after Versailles came into existence, all the four, many of the paintings and sculptures from here was moved to Versailles, but still many remained here. So this was a place where people can discuss and improve their thoughts. So the Louvre had a very peculiar 10 day schedule. Seven days were given for scholars and architects to come and study about the paintings and two days it was open for the public and the last day is for maintenance. So Louvre was one of the hot spots where people were together to discuss about the change in democracy, the change in the political way in which uh, Paris was working and things and stuff. So this was one of the places where uh, there were a lot of thinking going around about the revolution and it started to fire it up. And also there are many coffee shops which sprung around Paris during this period where people used to have a coffee and discuss about a lot of things. Uh, one of the ma famous places is uh, Le Prochop which was one of the oldest coffee shops in Paris and this was frequented by many of the revolutionists whom we will know in the later part of this episode and uh, this was a breeding ground of ideas and uh, very revolutionary thoughts which were not spoken even after uh, for a very long time in the French culture. The marriage of Louis XVI and the Austro-Hungarian Prince Maria Antoinette happened on 
June 16th of May 1770 in Versailles. It was a very lavish wedding which happened in a, at a cost of a very huge sum of money. The French people at the very start were not quite happy with this marriage because this was an alliance with them and the Austrian Empire and this was not a very good thing because Austria and France were in right for a very long time and they were like the arch enemies of Europe but this uh, marriage brought up very good and also bad thing the good thing was there was a peace for in Europe for a quite some time and the bad thing was because of the alliance France was pulled into a seven year wars with the British the marriage was was not going very well uh, because Louis was not having, uh, having a baby for about four years because of quite some issue within the relationship and uh, at last after a long time they had a baby which was a girl this there was quite a rumor that there was a problem with Louis and he was operated to have a baby but we are not quite sure about it but at the end the loyal couple had a baby who was a girl and this was quite a good thing because for the royal highness and after this they went on to have four more kids where they had only one ga one baby boy who could be the high successor of Louis the 16 to describe Louis personally, he was a very bit a shy of a person. He didn't quite go well with his new bride and they didn't have a, quite a good relationship at the very start. This was quite evident with the letters which was passed on between Maria Antoinette and his father, uh, King Ferdinand of Austria. And uh, it was King Ferdinand who came to uh, France to have a discussion with Louis and his uh, wife to settle down things. And then uh, they had a baby. So he was quite a very shy person. Uh, basically and this was quite evident at the later part of his career when he was very reluctant to take decisions uh, during very critical time because Louis was not the selected person for to become a king it was supposed to be his brother so Louis was always uh, discarded in many important things which had uh, left a many which has left a very uh, scar on his heart uh, when considered to taking up uh, responsibility in his life and he bec started to become very shy person because of this negligence and this was uh, having a lot of effect on his personal life also with growing resentment among the commoners after firing the necker for the second time king louis conveyed the meeting of the third estate on 1st of may 1789 the third estate which has a major strength had few representative in the national assembly also the noble and the clergy tried to push under the carpet the issues of the third estate. They were asked to dress in plain clothes for the National Assembly and nobody led ears for their concern. Frustrated on these topics, the third estate tried to meet the king to voice the king concern, but the king made a grave mistake by shutting the doors of the palace for the third estate. This decision was made by the king in order to please the nobility because the king thought this if he had a discussion with the third estate separately this may cause an uproar among the nobles and the clergy that the king is going towards the third estate so the king tried to avoid it uh, to speak with the third estate in order not to make the nobility to get anger and this has caused a quite a lot of uproar and the third estate decided that they don't more need the king and this started the revolution in a much larger scale than uh, it was previously uh, done in uh, France. This concludes part 1 of French Revolution. I just want to summarize the things which you saw in part 1. We saw the place where Louis XVI and his family were kept as prisoners, which is the Knight Templar prison in the north of Paris. We saw that it Chateau de Versailles was built by Louis XIV and was occupied by Louis XVI and he did a lot of things in uh, Versailles to build it in a larger scale. Then we saw the growing resentment in people's mind and want a change of regime which was quite a big cultural change when you consider Europe during the, those years. And then we saw uh, the personal life of Louis. He got married to Maria Antoinette who was an Austrian prince in Versailles. Then their problem in having a child. They, it was, took him four years for them to have a baby. And then we saw mistakes done by Louis when he conveyed at the meeting of all the estates but never looked into the issue of the third estate which was leading into a more growing resentment among the people. So in part two we will look into two important issues which led into the French Revolution on a larger scale. The first being the oath of tennis court where the democracy was born, the world's first democracy was born and secondly the storming of Bastille uh, prison which sent a very strong signal to people in Versailles that people of Paris are in control of the city and they will not bend to any of the royal regime's order and this series will also have part 3 and part 4 uh, majorly because French Revolution is a very big topic to cover and I tried my maximum best to shrink them into a content which can be 
less than of uh, 30 or 40 minutes so it will have part 3 and part 4 uh, to have more clear picture about the French Revolution so meet you guys on the part 2 of French Revolution I wanted to like to thank uh, Sharath uh, who was the cameraman for uh, this series and also the series uh, which are going to see in later parts and uh, Kadrivel Murugayan who was uh, helping us a lot in making uh, this series and also uh, Balakishwar Sundaram was quite tolerant to hear all the stories which I was about to say before I took this series. So stay tuned on this uh, YouTube channel, do subscribe and uh, the motivation which you guys will show uh, towards making of uh, these uh, um, uh, videos either it is positive or negative will greatly help me and my team to improve the quality of the films which you take and also to take more of them in the near future. So thank you guys and have a nice week.